Merhaba sevgili Açık Bey'in dostları. İkinci kez Doktor Jill Bolti Taylor'la karşınızdayız. Bugün kendisiyle buluşmamızın önemli bir sebebi var. Benim de biraz aracılık etmekten mutluluk duyduğum bir çeviri yapıldı. Jill Bolti Taylor'ın The Whole Brain Living kitabı tüm beyinle yaşam olarak Türkçe'ye çevrildi. Benim de kitabın içinde bir sunuş yazım var. Çok önemli bir kitap olduğunu düşünüyorum. Sağ olsun Turti kitap da gerekli girişimleri yaparak bu kitabı Türkçemize kazandırdı. Bugün kitabın yazarı hepinizin muhtemelen Açık Bey'in takipçilerini çok iyi tanıdı ama bütün dünyada da çok iyi bilinen Dr. Jill Bolti Taylor'la bu kitabı yazma süreci üzerine biraz konuşacağız. Tabii konuşmamız İngilizce olacak ama alt yazılarla takip edebileceksiniz. Zaten İngilizce bilen arkadaşlar için sorun yok ve ben müsaadenizle Jill'le muhabbetimize başlamak istiyorum. Jill, thank you very much for being here. Very nice I'm to have excited you. to be with you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Me too. This is the second time we meet over the internet. Hopefully, we can come face to face and talk more about these subjects because it's very important what you teach to the world if you ask me as a neuroscientist myself you are emphasizing very important points about what's the meaning of being human how to live in a better way and you actually had a very interesting coincidence in your life you are a neuroscientist and you have a stroke and you experienced a very interesting chain of events and finally you wrote a book my stroke of insight uh, with your very famous ted talk and Now this, this book, this is your second book, The Whole Brain Living. Yeah. What was the process of forcing you to write this book? What is the main purpose <laughs> behind this book? I want to hear it from you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, you know, I was, a, I was a neuroscientist and I had this stroke in the left hemisphere. And then over mm -hmm. four hours, I just watched my brain completely deteriorate, but just my left hemisphere. So I could not walk, talk, read, write, or recall any of my life. And I got to really exist in that space of not being a normal human for eight years. And I decided I was normal when I felt as though the group of cells in my left hemisphere that define the boundaries of where I begin and end actually defined me again as a solid instead of as a fluid. And so it was at that point I realized, well, that was the first thing that went and it's the last thing that came back. And it was like, okay, now I'm back and I, I have all abilities again. And so I gave the TED Talk and the purpose of the TED Talk was to communicate to people that we have peace right here in our right hemisphere. We have the capacity at any moment in time to tune in to our peaceful circuitry and by quieting down the noise going on in our left hemisphere. And I thought, okay, that's a, that's a message worth spreading. So I did the TED Talk and I had already written my memoir outlining detail by detail the morning of the stroke and what I learned from that experience and what I needed in order to recover from that kind of a, of a neurological trauma. So I gave the TED Talk to the world and that's when I became uh, instantaneously famous along with TED. But it was a miss because what I wanted it to do was I wanted people to revere themselves as a living being. Oh my gosh, this wondrous creature that I am, I am alive. But what happened instead was people revered me, Jill Bolte Taylor, because, oh my gosh, you've been on this journey. Wow, the TED Talk. Oh my gosh, it was beautiful. It was like, mm, that wasn't what I wanted. What I wanted was each of us to acknowledge and understand and perceive ourselves as this magnificent miracle of life. So I felt like, you know, I rode a big wave and that book came out in, I don't know, 31, 32 languages. And it was like, I went on the world tour and had a great time meeting amazing people, but it wasn't what I really wanted it to be. And I kept thinking to myself, how do I communicate to people what I have learned? How do I give it to them so it's theirs instead of just mine? And I was given a presentation at a, con at a conference and I, I was talking about the brain and, you know, I got my beautiful brain and I love my beautiful brain and happy to talk about the brain. 
But I said, you know, I love talking about the brain in this day and age, because in this day and age, people actually like to learn about the brain. And I love that they understand the language and they understand that there's amygdala and there's hippocampi. But the fact of the matter is that there's two amygdala and two hippocampi. And there was literal gasp in the room. And I realized, oh my God, everybody thinks we have one amygdala and one hippocampus and one emotional system. And that was it because we clearly have two amygdala, two hippocampi, and two emotional systems. And the right hemisphere is a very different place than the left hemisphere. And people, if people understood that they had what the differences were between the two hemispheres and that they have emotional tissue as well as thinking tissue in each hemisphere in those modules of cells, then that was the key to people understanding. And that's when I got excited and it was like, this is whole brain living, right? This is how do I train somebody to understand what their brain is, what the tissue is, what those modules of cells are, and how they each of you know, those four modules do different things, and they actually end up having different personalities. So that's when I got really excited, and I sat down and I wrote Whole Brain Living and two years ago, and then last year it was launched, and I've just been you know talking about it ever since. And it's beautiful, and people are getting this material so well, and and so if if like I'm working with somebody who does yoga and she does yoga as it relates to addiction and 12 step programming. So she's taking whole brain living into helping these people who are managing their addictions. And then I have someone else taking yoga into prisons and it's like, oh my gosh, how do I help you? And I've got somebody who's using whole brain living in schools for the administration and for the parents so that they can build this whole brain team, the village within which the children are brought up. So I am so on fire about what whole brain, the, the capacity and potential of whole brain living in our lives individually, as well as in our communities. Definitely. As a neuroscientist teacher myself, I felt a little bit jealous. I must say that because it's a very simple, understandable, but strikingly strong matrix yeah. you are describing. We have two different sides of our brain and we have two different yeah. thinking brains and we have also two different sensing brains or feeling brains. So it's a very right. powerful and understandable thing. But why do you think normal people with no interest in science or brain sciences or whatsoever need to yeah. know this is it just for you know to get rid of some kind of disease or do you have another message for normal people we generally call ourselves normal but when i read your right. book i don't feel normal because i mostly you know live left inclined in my life mostly so we need to find some kind of balance. What do you say about this? What I bring to the conversation with this book is the ability to recognize the different parts of who I am. And let's say when I'm sitting in front of you in a Zoom conversation, I'm using a very specific groups of cells inside of my brain. And that group of cells is fitting me into the social norm. I put on my clothes, I put on my earrings, I put on my glasses, I comb my hair, I put on my lipstick. I got my environment all set up just right. Well, that's a specific group of cells inside of my brain. It was not appropriate for me to come in fresh from playing pickleball, all shaggy, just like sweaty pig, right? Slopping around and like looking like a wild animal. Well, that's another part of my brain. It's not a bad part of my brain. I love that part of my brain. That part of my brain is curious and innovative and interesting and in my body and physical and interested and enthusiasm, but it wouldn't have been appropriate for this moment in time. So because I can distinguish between these four different groups of cells and these four different personalities, then I can really negotiate with myself in a better way because I have this higher level of differentiation of who I am as a living being. And, you know, it's kind of differentiation is the ability to look at something and say, this is a part and that's a part and they fit together to make the whole. It's like, you know, and when we were babies, we could not differentiate the fact that we had two legs. And so in the beginning, we just had these, these things that we were just kind of this thing flopping around. And eventually it was like, oh, oh, I... I can differentiate that that thing is a part of me and I can control that. 
And then with more time, I can realize my digits and then I can get fine movement. So, so as a biological creature, it's really about differentiation, being able to differentiate, differentiate the different pieces of who we are. So why would we stop at just our physical body? Why wouldn't we want to differentiate our emotions? So if I'm experiencing, if I'm having an emotional experience and I know which part of me is having that emotional experience, I also can observe observe the other person and I can recognize if that person is sharing that emotional experience with me or if it's a miss. I can identify easily who in you, which of your four characters I can interact with in order to have an intellectual conversation as opposed to if we're going to create something. And then when we decide that we're going to create a program together or something, and now it's like, okay, well, now we need to shift out of the judgment, out of the proper, out of the professional, out of that, and get into the, well, what do you think? Well, what do I think? Well, what do you feel about this? What do you think might work? Well, what can you imagine? And then we're in the present moment and we're creating something beautiful together without the judgment coming on. Well, of course, we have all of this them going on all the time. But when I, I actually can get to know the different parts of who I am, then I have the power to choose moment by moment who and how I want to be under any circumstance. And this is emotional power. This is personal power. This is accountability, holding myself both emotionally and cognitively accountable for not just what am I thinking and what am I feeling inside of me, but what am I bringing into an environment? Because I'm responsible for that energy that I'm bringing into the environment and what impact I'm going to have and what relationships I'm able to develop, healthy or unhealthy. So it's not just about personal development, but also this brain huddle, you call it, right? You're putting all the pieces together. Right. It actually enables us to better connect with the others. So there are more fruitful relationships and some healthy society maybe. So I need to underline exactly. this because if, if you if you just let me to decide, I will put this in every school to teach the kids in a very early age to how to use these four different compartments. But in your experience, you're now applying this as, as a, you know, teaching and, you know, telling people about that. How long will it take for a normal person to understand and use this ability to they put all the pieces of the brain together and, uh, you know, learn to act according to it. Is there a, you know, point of success or it's a lifelong thing? What do you think about this? What I am finding, what I'm finding, and this is just based on the feedback. If you go to a child and you say, okay, here are these, here are the four personalities, the four characters, and you have them and I have them and SpongeBob cartoon has them. Do you guys have SpongeBob over there? A child, if, if you say, okay, who's the character two in SpongeBob? They'll tell you. Who's the character one in SpongeBob? They'll tell you. You go to a, a teenage, preteen or teenager, and you say, let's talk Harry Potter, right? Who's the character one in Harry Potter? Hermione. Everybody knows that it's Hermione. She's the studious, the professional thinking. She's the that kind of intellectual processing. Well, who are the character threes? You know, and they'll tell you because these four characters are everywhere. And then once you realize that, and then you're looking around the world and you're looking in your house at your spouse or at your children or at your parents. And it's like, you know, every time my brother comes over, we get in a fight, right? And it's like, what's that about? Well, if my brother comes over and, he, and he's in his hostile, angry, emotionally unhappy character too, and he starts poking at me and kind of picking on me and kind of like wanting to fight with me. Well, then I can look at him now and I can say, yeah, I know how to fight with you. I have been fighting with you my entire life. I know how to boom. And we just get ugly and the whole holiday just got blown away, right? Because now Jill and, and her brother, we just can't get along well. And this is what's going to be happening over here with Thanksgiving and then Christmas holidays and all of that as we get families together. It's like we revert back to our childhood part of who we are in relationship. So how do we save ourselves from those kinds of negative encounters is to know what our choices are. If my brother comes in and he's just going to like come at me and it's my natural trigger to go back at him, what are my other choices?
choices. And because now I know all four of my characters, it's like, well, I can use my character one and I can just make sure that he's happy and he has his drink and he's going to get his food and he's, his needs are going to be met. But I don't have to engage with that hostility or, or when he pokes at me, I don't have to react as that part of my brain. Or I can actually like be curious and kind of try to play with him and, and see what is he doing that's fun in his life and try to get him out of his character two into his more fun character three, where he's actually telling stories or sharing, or we might want to play games games, but we're having a different relationship. And then ultimately we're all wired for this ability to have a spiritual, beautiful, loving connection with one another as fundamental right as a human being to be able to love. And I can wrap my brother up regardless of what he's coming at me with. I can wrap him up with love. I can be love in the presence of him. And I don't have to let him emotionally trigger me. So, you know, children tend to pick up on this immediately. They get it. Teenagers, they get it. But these are also the ages at which we tend to not hold grudges, right? We, we as we mature, we that's when we tend to hold on to, yeah, but you know, I had a conversation with him three years ago and he said this and I thought that that was rude. And, and so I don't like him anymore and I just don't want to hang out with him. And it's like, and I'm never going to let that go. And if we ever do talk about it, you know, we're going to be like this about it. <laughs> It's just like, ladies and gentlemen, let go of the ugly. We don't have to constantly project onto one another all the stuff and all the pain from our past. We have the power to choose to, is it real? Sure. And it's going to fester inside of that little character too, but we don't have to give character to the microphone so that we just really ruin all of our relationships and we just keep ruining all of our relationships. Definitely. Actually, the, the question was just about that because I tried this in two instances right after I read your book and it worked. So it, it took no time actually for me, but I wondered, is it because I'm a neuroscientist? I know stuff. No, actually, if you know how to use it, you can use it in your daily life. I, hopefully everyone right. learns and tries these in their lives. My final question, my long-term curiosity about yourself personally. First, you are a unique combination. What I mean by that, you had a devastating stroke. It's a very bad experience, of course. And you have also a deep background in neuroanatomy in your life as a profession. And as far as I can sense from you, whenever we talk, whenever I listen to you, you have a deep sense for spirituality beforehand, as far as I understand. You are somehow have a kind of acquaintance with the spirituality. You know the stuff. And you are a hilarious storyteller, I can see that. And you're a very funny person. And all Thank of you. them are together. What do you think? Is this a coincidence? Because, for example, if another person have a neuroanatomy degree, has a stroke and something like that, maybe they cannot yeah. do what you do. What do you make out of it? Yeah, I think if you look at the recipe of what I am, I think neuroscientist, yes, that was important because I had to be able to have that relationship with the anatomy of the brain to be able to, you know, come back and rebuild it. I think that the magic piece for me is that my brother has been diagnosed with schizophrenia. So as a little bitty girl, you can tell right here, I go straight into my heart. My brother, who is only 18 months older than I, was a unpredictable yet magnificent companion for little Jill. And he was magnificent because he was my brother. You know, he was my big brother. Of course, I adored my big brother. But we also had the kind of relationship because of his schizophrenia that I got to see at a very early age that two people can be very, very different from one another. They can look very similar. They can sound very similar. You look at me and my brother and it is unquestionably, we are siblings, but my brother lives a life of deep tragedy and pain. And how do I help him? How do I take myself out of just what am I, who is Jill, and try to understand and help and work with this man who ended up with a, a, a brain that could not relate his dreams to his reality. And as a result, his he has ended up living a, a real life of pain and tragedy. So I think that that's where the heart comes in for me. And that relationship is the core reason why I am who I am. I must say that this is a beautiful book. 
very well written, Thank very you. informative, but the author of this book is a magnificent human being. Thank you very much you. for being with us. It's very a oh. big pleasure to have you here. I want to see you face to face, hopefully in the near future. And I want to shake your hands to give my gratitude. Thank you, Thank you very much. Please keep up the good work. We're waiting more of these in the future. Thank you. It's so good to be with Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone.